When people ask me if I went to film school, I tell them, no, I went to films. Quentin Tarantino has risen as one of the most respected filmmakers in Hollywood, thanks in part to his unique writing style and ultra-violent films. He's an actor's director and has proven it time and time again. He's a two-time Oscar winner and has his own word in the Oxford English Dictionary, Tarantino-esque. Characterized by graphic and stylized violence, non-linear storylines, cine-literate references, satirical themes, and sharp dialogue. Today on Filmgasm, me and special guest Austin Johnson will chronicle the impressive film career of Quentin Tarantino, the self-made artist who paints his films with blood and end bombs <laughs> From his 1992 debut Reservoir Dogs to his much-anticipated 2019 Manson Family reimagining Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. In this epic two-part raging filmgasm that also marks the very first Weird Shit Wednesday. From now on, every fifth episode will focus on a filmmaker's career, a Hollywood scandal, or some other bizarre situation connected in some way to a movie. Now, before we get started, thanks for tuning in. My name is Connor Izagari. I'm a massive film buff, and Filmgasm is a podcast where I talk about my favorite genre, horror, as well as weird Hollywood shit that piques my interest. If you'd like to see more from Filmgasm, feel free to visit Filmgasm.com. That's F-I-L-M-G-A-Z-M, where you can check out daily movie reviews, articles about movies, the newest trailers, and all of my early podcasts that I did with my partners, including Austin here. Now allow me to introduce my partner and collaborator, Austin Johnson. Take it away, man. How's it going? I'm so fucking excited to do this. This guy might very well be my favorite, favorite man to do it uh, behind the camera, uh, but he also writes, like you said. He's someone who has said, has claimed that I am a director, I just have to write shit for myself to do, because no one else can do it as good as I can. Well said. Um, he's <laughs> arrogant as hell, he's an asshole, but he deserves all of the fame he's gotten, all of the money he's gotten, all of the Oscar nominations, Golden Globe nominations, uh, wins, he deserves it all, and uh, we're going to give him a couple hours here tonight, I uh, hope you guys will buckle up, because this is going to be a fucking fun ride. That's right, it's going to be part one of two, In this one we're going to focus on primarily... Tarantino's run in the 90s, and end with part one of Kill Bill. Uh, so let's get started. Quentin Tarantino started his career in films when he worked at Video Archives in Manhattan Beach, California, for $200 a week. <laughs> <laughs> 200 bucks a week, and now he's Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. His first attempt at directing was a 1987 comedy called My Best Friend's Birthday. The entire cast and crew was comprised of his co-workers at Video Archives. It took three years to make... And is available to watch in its entirety on YouTube. It has never had a official release. He's probably very ashamed of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd say so. It has a 5.7 on IMDb and Yikes. a 45% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. It has no critic score. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh the only Tarantino God. film I haven't seen and probably never will. Yeah, that, that, that one's... Uh, would you even call it, you know, I, you know, put it in there? I guess you have to. It's only like... like 57 minutes long. It's oh, very geez. short. It's got something to do with... I, I, I read the plot summary, but I don't really remember what it was about. It had something to do with, like, somebody's uh, depressed and his co-worker decided to throw him, like, the greatest birthday of all time. I don't know. It just doesn't sound anything Five, like... 5.7 sounds like a pass for me. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me. I know, but at the same time, it's a piece of yeah, Tarantino's uh, yeah. catalog. Eventually, and it, like you said, if it's, if it's under an hour, come on. You can get through yeah. that. Who doesn't have that kind of time? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Don't be so selfish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, he followed that with his true debut, the 1992 cult hit Reservoir Dogs. Can I say something here? Sure. Reservoir Dogs, I, I want to say something, because this is my first uh, official filmgasm. Um, I guess my first, uh, being a guest, this is my first time. Reservoir Dogs is probably the, the single movie I could point out, turn, my turning point of why I became a film fan. Of why I became someone, now I want to do this. I want to write things. I want to, you know, come up with ideas with people and talk about movies. And uh, that's why I'm here with you. And Reservoir Dogs is a big part of that because I had no idea you can make a movie based in one room for almost the entire thing and entertain me the whole time. <laughs> and I was like, if you can do that, if he can do that, I can do that. If someone can make a story in one room and doesn't have to have all this pa pa pa, all this crazy stuff going on, it can be built on dialogue and character, I can fucking do that. And so this is the one I saw where I was like, holy shit, I think this is the kind of where I want to go, and uh, Tarantino's a big part of that, so I'll let you get back to Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. I had that wow. planned out, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for... That's, that's, that's great, this, man. It's a very special film to me, yeah. <laughs> me too, for sure. Uh, so Reservoir Dogs 
stars a lot of actors who would become part mm-hmm. of Tarantino's go-to circle. Oh, yeah. Including Harvey Keitel, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and Steve Buscemi, as well as Chris Penn and Lawrence Tierney in this film. It's about a group of criminals who come together for a big heist, only to have the whole thing fall apart due to one of them being an undercover cop. The whole movie is the aftermath of the heist, as the criminals, who all have colorful code names, bicker over who among them is the rat. It's got an IMDb score of 8.3 and a Rotten Tomatoes score of 91%. And mm. well earned. Reservoir Dogs has remained an absolute classic in modern cinema. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's it's one of those um, that you can point back to, especially with the strong characters. Like you know, you said it's a heist heist movie with they all have the colors. It's very easy to point out who's who. Um, very easy to quote. It's one of those kind of cultural like bombs. Like it's a. I won't even call it a cult classic anymore because it's too big. It's too too popular, too big at this point. Yeah. Oh, we've had, you know, 20 plus, what, 27 years since this came out. So uh, we've had plenty of time to digest and now it's just a monstrous movie. For sure. And it's, I, what I love about it is you never see the heist. No. It's all told. The entire movie is dialogue. Mm-hmm. And that's brilliant. Nobody did that before Tarantino did that. He built an entire career on dialogue and it's amazing. It's mm-hmm. Yeah, not, not not showing ma- major actions where most audiences would be like, wait, what the hell? What? There was a gap we missed. Like, where yeah. is that? But rather just distract you with, oh, I, I got to keep up because this character is saying things I have to hear. So uh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. It truly is. And it, all the performances are gold. And you can tell everybody knew they were a part of something special. That this was the beginning For of sure. something that For was going to sure. last forever. And they looked like they were having fun. Oh, like, yeah. Just these guys... Like you said, you know, we look now, we're like, oh my god, these badass guys who went on to do more things, not yeah. just in Tarantino films, but all over the place. Yeah. This was the beginning of Tim Roth's career. <sighs> oh, yeah. The beginning of Steve Buscemi's career. Mm-hmm. Like, this was huge. I would say it rejuvenated Harvey Keitel a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, where he was a little bit older when this came out than the other characters, so. Absolutely. Michael Madsen was frightening. Uh, he's, yeah. You know, you have that awesome scene with him and the cop. And Mr. You're like, Blonde. This guy's, yeah, Mr. Blonde's. Oh, I, I kind of hate him, but I love him. <laughs> and Reservoir Dogs also started a another trend for Tarantino, which was a killer soundtrack. Oh, Jesus Christ. Soundtrack and dialogue are Tarantino's two biggest things, really. And it's just <laughs> the music in this movie. And it's all through Kate Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s Weekend, which is happening around the movie with comedian Stephen Wright being a DJ, which is just perfect. <laughs> and every song fits every situation, and he is never off. In every film he's ever done, he's never <laughs> no. off with music. No, that's the one thing I think he has over their big... I think Scorsese misses a lot on music, I think. Um, I think there's guys who use scores maybe more, but guys who use soundtracks uh, exclusively, like Tarantino is big on using soundtracks. Yeah. He's, the, he's the best at it, at placing it exactly where it needs to be. It's spaced out. It's not only that. Um, there's times where there's dialogue going on. You hear something in the background in his films. It's really cool. A lot of fun. And yeah, Res- Reservoir Dogs kicked that off, being like, oh man, this guy's... It's kind of, it makes it feel like there's an album almost in in the movie because it plays you know plays along so well with what's happening. He makes the songs characters for sure, for sure, and that's that's, that's a skill. Like, yeah, it's a it's skill. absolutely a skill, yeah, for sure. And that was his first movie, his first real movie. <laughs> and that's a lot of people think this is his best. Yeah. His if best you're going to start that strong, <laughs> like to to go you know further than that is next to impossible. But he did it time and time again. Yep. It, and that's why we're still loving his m- movies. And, that's why we're doing this. Yeah. Because yeah, it's sustained excellence, you know? Yeah, for sure. And that's that's exactly what we want. It's it's amazing. Uh, back when I started this thing, when it was still on YouTube, we ha- I had yeah. a short-lived series called Jackrabbit Slims, where mm-hmm. my old partner Ashley and I would talk about Quentin Tarantino movies. And we only did Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Okay. But uh, I remember you, I listened to the Pulp yeah. Fiction one. I remember that. Yeah. If you do want to go back and listen to me talk about Reservoir Dogs a little bit more, feel free to check that out on YouTube. Uh, yeah, that's Reservoir Dogs. So, that was his debut. And then in 1993, Tarantino sold a script for 50 grand that was developed by Tony Scott using his original script, True Romance. Yes. It's about a film buff who falls in love with a prostitute and skips off to Hollywood with a bunch of coke he stole from her pimp. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. I love this movie so much. <laughs> True Romance is Tarantino's most underrated classic. Yeah. And a lot of people don't consider it one of his because he didn't direct it. Yeah, he just but wrote. It is yeah. absolutely his movie. 
And it's worth every fucking penny of that 50000 Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's worth way more. Absolutely. So this is one of, to me, if you're just looking at story, if you were to just read, just read what, like, story plot-wise, this is one of his best best projects. Well, he can, he um, said that True Romance is his most autobiographical film, which raises some mm, questions. Is he... I doubt. I think he... Is he Gary Oldman? <laughs> <laughs> I he, think he's just... Um, he was a film buff who, like, I think that's really it, really. The film buff part <laughs> is probably it for autobiography. And, and I guess I guess he, you know, lived in Southern California for, I guess. Well, yeah, that's where this all started. He yeah, the, yeah. The video store. But but I, I guess that's autobiographical, I guess, for Tarantino. Wasn't he born, like, in Tennessee? Or... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Whatever. <laughs> you know, he lives in his own world. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, he is de- maybe he is Gary Oldman. God. Well, actually, funny note. Uh, Gary Oldman said that this was his favorite role of his that he's ever done. Wow. Yeah, Drexel Spy. Think about it. the man has won an Oscar. And that think, is think about the career of Gary Oldman. I mean, you look back like Leon, Sid, and Nancy. Just Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. Harry Potter. The guy has killed it so many times. But True Romance was his favorite. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. It, 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 it's one of my favorite uh, characters he's ever done. Yeah. He's off. He's off the wall. Yeah, Drexel Spivey's a fucking bastard, but he's he's, a white, <laughs> he's a white dude who thinks he's a black guy, and that's awesome. He's I, a, he's yeah, a pimp. I I don't even know if he he even knows what what he is or what I I've, I've thought about that a lot when I rewatch him. Like, what it, what the fuck was going on in Tarantino's head with this with this character? Does this guy think like you said? Does he think he's black? Does he want to be black? I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. I think he's just confused with you know everything. He's probably so whacked out. That he doesn't even know. So the film stars Christian Slater, uh, Patricia Arquette, mm-hmm. Dennis Hopper, Gary Oldman, Brad Pitt, and Christopher Walken. Yes. And arguably my favorite performance of his. Yeah, let's hear the quote. Let's hear the... <laughs> I'm the Antichrist, and you got me in a vendetta kind of mood. <laughs> Holy fuck, that is an amazing That's line. That's a really cool line. That is intimidating as hell. Uh, he's yeah. only in wet, wet, uh, that one scene, but he steals the whole movie. He really does, and he yeah. turns it. He turns the movie from okay. It it, it changed its its pace changed completely once he oh yeah appeared and said that and you're like, shit got oh real real fast. Yeah, Christian Slater's in fucking trouble. Vincenzo Cocati, played by Walken, interrogates Clifford Worley, played by Dennis Hopper, and it's the best scene of the movie. Legendary scene. Itself. Those two are just toe to toe. Oh yeah, man. The racist conversation they have yeah. that leads to Dennis Hopper getting blown away oh my god amazing good I, stuff i could watch just that one scene over and over again for sure uh it's got an imdb score of 7.9 and a rotten tomato score of 92 percent hell yeah very few of his films dip under like 80 <laughs> yeah yeah it's rare yeah it's rare to see and true romance wasn't directed by tarantino it was directed by tony scott but it does still exist inside tarantino's established film universe more on that later uh, so the next year, 1994, was a big year for Tarantino. First of all, he sold another script, which would be directed by Oliver Stone and heavily rewritten by Oliver Stone and two others, David Velos and Richard Rutowski. And that film would be Natural Born Killers. Mm-hmm. The only film that Tarantino has all but disowned. The final version was a shell of what he had originally written, and it remains the only film connected to Tarantino that, admittedly, I don't really like. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I, I'm totally fine saying that's it's not good. And I think it's, it's just good. because it doesn't have any Tarantino left in it. It's Oliver Stone's movie now. Mm-hmm. And Oliver Stone really kind of treats it like... I think I reviewed this movie a few years ago on the website. Nice. And I think I, I said something about it being like a high school student's art project. Because <laughs> it's just so choppily <laughs> edited and annoying. <laughs> But I'll give credit where credit's due. The performances are incredible. Like, all right, so Natural One Killers follows a serial killing couple, Mickey and Mallory Knox, played phenomenally by Woody Harrelson and mm-hmm. Juliette Lewis. Yes. As they become media sensations across the country, kind of a modern day Bonnie and Clyde. And the film features some wild, memorable performances from uh, Robert Downey Jr., yes. Tommy Lee Jones, and Rodney Dangerfield, of all people. Oh, shit, I forgot about that. Yeah, Rodney Dangerfield yeah, yeah, in that yeah. movie is fucking gross. <laughs> He's like an incestuous father, and it's so twisted, oh, and it's so unlike anything he'd ever done. <laughs> it stands out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
Natural Born Killers, it's, I don't know. What do, you, do you remember what you gave it on your review? I think a six. A six, that six sounds right. Ten. That sounds right. Not bad, but, you It's know. not bad, yeah. it's just, I only ever watch it if I have to. Yeah, it's not something you're like, alone. I'm just gonna throw yeah. it, throw Natural Born Killers. It's the only one I don't own. Off. I have all the rest of his films, I don't have that one. Yeah. I don't really plan on having it either. You know what, I have to make, I, I have to be honest. I don't own that one, and I don't own Inglorious Bastards. Really? I don't know why. I thought oh, I man. did. I thought I did, and I've been rewatching them all this past week, and I was like, what the fuck is my copy of Inglorious Bastards? <laughs> I was like, you know what? I don't think I have it. And I don't. I don't have it. So, Shit. Needless to say, that's what I'm going to be doing this weekend. That's a is, surprise. Uh, is buying that. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I think it was like on stuff, and I just, I don't know, like... Just passed me up. I have everything else, but <laughs> fucking that blew my that blew me away. <laughs> well, you never know till you know. Yeah, when I was, that's that also was like, oh, that's a problem. If I don't know, I <laughs> but I have sort of, and I'm looking through my my collection. I'm like, oh fuck, it's not there. I either lost it or I never had it. So wow, I had to admit that at some point. I want to get that out of the way now. <laughs> I do. I love that movie. It's not. I'm not saying like it's less than <laughs> just because I don't have it. I love it. So well, Natural Born Killers. <clears throat> Has an IMDb score of seven point three. Wow! And this is the that's only... kind of surprising. I know it's pretty high. This is the only time where I'm going to mention the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes because the critic score is forty seven percent, which I agree with, but the viewer score is eighty one. What a jump! That is a huge. I haven't heard of that difference. Yeah, that gap, and I don't understand it. Like a thirty four point gap. Like yikes! Critics did not like Natural Born Killers. Tarantino did not like Natural Born Killers. <laughs> And fun fact, in the research for this, I found out that True Romance and Natural Born Killers were originally one giant screenplay that was about Mickey and Mallory Knox going to Hollywood and getting mixed up with the mob there and cocaine and then going on a killing spree. Just kind of being, yeah, yeah, this rowdy couple. But nobody would buy a five-hour movie. No. So no. he split it into these two scripts and sold them. Also, that would have been interesting, like, what would have happened to characters, like... You know, we wouldn't would we not have Christian Slater's performance if that was like the case? Yeah, you know? we might never. Yeah, might not have some of the great moments we have from True Romance might not be there. If that Characters was... like Drexel Spivey might have been yeah. cut for time. Shit. Yeah. No. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to leave True Romance as it is. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that was the first half of '94 for Tarantino. So not very good. The later half of '94 would be got pretty little, fucking huge. Got a little bit better for Tarantino. Yeah. So later in 1994, Quentin Tarantino would become a household name. Wait, what, what month did this come out? Uh, Natural Born Killers was in August. Yes. And, and then... Pulp Fiction was in October. Okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was it was pretty close. It was, yeah. yeah. It was very close. Yeah. Pretty close. But this was the film that many consider to be his undisputed masterpiece, Pulp Fiction. Classic. An ensemble piece in which the lives of two hitmen, a washed-up boxer, a mob boss and his wife, and two thieves all intertwine in one very strange day. The film features career-defining performances... From John Travolta, Samuel L. Jackson, Uma Thurman, Bruce Willis, and Ving Rhames, as well as unforgettable appearances from Tim Roth, Amanda Plummer, Harvey Keitel, Christopher Walken, and Eric Stoltz. Pulp Fiction. <laughs> we could go on and on yeah, about yeah. Pulp Fiction. It's one of the most incredible films of all time. I agree. <laughs> ah, man. I think about this movie a lot. It plays in my head a lot, as cliche as that might be. But uh, another, there's something to, there's something to say about repetition and something to say about constantly thinking about something is kind of what you become is when you think about something over and over and consume it. And Pulp Fiction's a huge part of my life, and fuck, I, I enjoy it more now than I did six years ago. You know, yeah. ten years ago when I first saw it, um, I, I I'm still finding things, still finding things after my two hundredth time watching it. I'm still finding things I I'm laughing at, and things that I'm like, oh my god, that's so dark, or Oh, I didn't catch that lighting. This, it's insane. Um, like you said, we could go on and on. Uh, th- this, this, this is it's the best movie. Um, most complete. The performances are perfect. It's constructed beautifully. The cultural impact it has still is unreal. So uh, it, it's to me, yeah, like it's his masterpiece. Has yeah. to be. He revitalized John Travolta's career, gave him a second chance, which he then later blew big time. Yeah, but. That's not what this is about. <laughs> More on that. Check out the Battlefield Earth podcast I did last year. But um, 
Yeah, the performances are all incredible. The, the The story is so captivating. Yeah, it's it's mm, one of his cooler stories. Uh, yeah. uh, the next one we're going to talk about is one of my favorite stories, but I really yeah. like this one. Uh, and it's all told out of sequence. And yeah, which is which is like I, I've heard people be like, well, "Well, that's not that hard." And it's like, yeah, but no one no one does it. So. Until someone does it, until someone makes it look that cool and make it look that pristine and make it all make sense, then I don't care. Like, that's a stupid argument. You know, people want to say that it's not that difficult to, like, piece something together like that. And it's like, then why don't more people do it? Yeah. Tarantino d- does those little things that people don't do. That's what makes it so much fun. Uh, and, you know, the, the beginning scene, like you said, you know, we start out seeing something that we're going to see at the very end of the movie. Yeah. At the very end, and it picks back up, but it's also like, wait a minute, that guy's dead. <laughs> what, what about that guy? You know, and uh, it's, it's really cool, uh, really refreshing, and allows, every time I watch it, allows me to just kind of fuck it and just go with it. I, yep. it you have to go with each wave because it doesn't stop. Uh, Pulp Fiction has some of Tarantino's most memorable and iconic scenes. Lines, quotes, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the whole Ezekiel 2517 speech alone. Is... Yeah, and, and that at the and you think like, oh, is this guy like a Bible believing? And he's like, I just thought it was some cold blooded shit to say before yeah. I popped a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so cool. Like it, you kind of you kind of see like each character progress without them without even trying. It's just by this is what's happening in their life. And it's a film with five or six main characters in separate stories, but there's not a weak link among them. Oh no, every story is captivating and no. super intriguing, and it all connects back to the main arc, which is fascinating and just incredibly talented writing. For sure. For sure. And it's, it remains just an absolute classic. And I think 94, the year it was nominated for Best Picture, it would have taken it if it hadn't been such a stacked category. Yeah. But, you know. Uh, I feel like it would have won it, like, if we would have given it some time, maybe. Because uh, th- this now, I mean, how do you... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's hard for me to talk about because I, I don't like the movie that beat it. <laughs> well, the film was nominated for seven Oscars, including Tarantino's first win for original screenplay. Yep. Well deserved. Oh, yeah. He shared it with Roger Avery, his uh, longtime collaborator from the video store. Uh, and Pulp Fiction was the first to have numerous connections to his other films, which is where the idea of a shared universe comes in. Uh, a couple examples. Travolta's character, Vincent Vega is the brother of Michael Madsen's character from Reservoir Dogs, Vic Vega. Uh, we're introduced to Big Kahuna Burger and Red Apple Cigarettes, two fake brand names that frequently appear in his films. Mm-hmm. He hates product placement with a passion, so he makes yeah. his own products. Yeah, you very really see... That's why you see a lot of like close-up shots where you'll see like people's faces and you, know, you won't see signs or anything around because he fucking hates that stuff. So it's really, <laughs> it's really cool. And he's stuck to his guns, like, he, his whole career. He's not... He's let never up. sold out. He doesn't ever. let up on that. A lot of scenes were, like, you know, in a warehouse yeah. or, um, you know, in Hateful Eight, it's, like, in this one house. So there's not there's nothing to see because it's all yeah. just people fucking dealing with stuff going on. So it's really cool. <laughs> uh, there's a rumor that the contents of Marcellus Wallace's briefcase are actually the diamonds from the heist in Reservoir Dogs. That's very that possible. Yeah. Joe Cabot, Lawrence Tierney from Reservoir Dogs, was working for Marcellus, and Jules and Vincent's arc in Pulp Fiction is the cleanup for yeah. Reservoir Dogs, which is fucking awesome, if that's true. And uh, Mia Wallace's pilot, Fox Force 5, which she talks about in the movie, is the basic plot for Kill Bill, which blew my fucking mind when I heard it. I love that. that <laughs> I love how on the yeah. nose it is, but you kind of just miss it, you know? Yeah. Ah, oh, man. It's perfect. I've heard, uh, he, he was asked about this, and he said that Kill Bill is a movie that the characters in his universe would go see. Like, if Vincent and Jules went to the movies, uh, they would see yeah, Kill yeah, Bill. Yeah, 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 okay. That's why it's so hyper-violent, as opposed to everything else he's made. But, I mean, in this movie, like, a dude gets his head blown off in a car, so I don't know how hyper Marvin, yeah. yeah <laughs> oh, a... man, I shot Marvin in the face. John yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Travolta is so, yeah. Biggest... <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I love when they yeah. go to Tarantino's house. I'm a mushroom cloud land motherfucker, <laughs> motherfucker. Do you see a sign in front of my house? <laughs> uh, I know how good my coffee is. I don't need you to tell him how fucking good my coffee is. I'm the one who buys it. <laughs> that whole exchange is so great. He's so pissed. It's Jimmy. Fuck it. 
Tarantino's a terrible uh, actor, but I always like seeing I him. I don't... I never care. It never bothers me. It never bothers me. It just makes me laugh. Because he's having fun. He's like, I don't fucking care. Like, <laughs> I don't care if some stuff gets messed up or if something doesn't look, you know, totally correct. He, he's... He knows what he's he, he knows what he's doing, man. Yeah, love it. So, Pulp Fiction, what if you had to pick would be your favorite scene oh. in Pulp Fiction? Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah, tough, tough, tough question to answer. I know. <laughs> um, this is you know I'm I'm gonna explain myself, but I'm gonna go with the Gimp scene. Really? Um, not a lot of people say that. Yeah, uh, wow. a lot of people will be like, "Oh, it's weird." Uh, not be, not because <laughs> not not. Because I because it's it's uh, fuck this is hard it's hard to talk about because like when this scene comes on I'll be like yeah like not like you're like you know cop raping a guy that's horrible that's fucking horrible but it's the fucking payback they get a cop I hate cops <laughs> a rapist I hate rapist a greasy pawn shop owner watching I hate that guy too and they get sliced up with a sword and then shot up and God knows what happened to that hillbilly cop after. That's why I love that scene. And because Ving Rhames delivers the best dialogue of the whole movie. I won't repeat it because there's too many horrible things that are said. You've got you to enjoy that part. I'll say it. Go for it. <laughs> if you, if you want to say it, go for it. You hear me talking, hillbilly boy? I ain't through with you by a damn sight. I'm going to get medieval on your ass. That's my favorite fucking line in that me movie. Me too. Me too. That's why. <laughs> it's, not, it's not because of the gimp or because yeah. there's, you know, rape involved. Of course, I hate that stuff. It's just because so, I yeah. see them get taken down. Yeah. And because I see Bruce Willis, there's a little bit of human in him who's like, you know what? I can't let a rape go down. Yeah. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't care if they killed him, if they just went and shot him, or if they, you know, stole from him or beat him up. But rape him? Nah. You don't do that to another man, you know? Yeah. Fuck that. And he's a cop, fuck that. Like, I'm gonna go beat his ass. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. And it's really cool, because he sees the sword, and all of us are like, yeah, get him! And I like that scene a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> that's what I have to go with. Uh, Damn. Ten years ago, no, that would have been the scene that scared me the most. But yeah. uh, That's but, the scene yeah. that, uh, my mom hasn't seen this movie in 20 years, because she will not watch that scene. She won't watch the entire movie because of that scene. I've tried to get her on my side, she just won't do it. Fair enough. And that's, that, that's a shame, and the, Fair enough. The scene is so out of the fucking blue, and I can it's understand insane. why it freaks people out. It's insane. But I think it's an important scene, because it really, it's about masculinity, and how it could, fragile it is, really, and how it could be taken away, yep. but regained at the same time. Because mm-hmm. they take Marcellus's you know, masculinity away, but Butch takes it back. Yes. And it's just, it's crazy. It's... It's so it doesn't fit, but it fits at the same time. It's it's very strange. And, and yeah, and what, like what you're saying is probably what I wanted to say. I'm, I, I'll just echo that. It's like yeah, it fits. It totally works. It totally makes sense. And the masculinity thing is something so cool that Tarantino fucks with. It's like men have a hard time fucking talking to each other, or like figuring out, you know. And he's good at that the, that kind of stuff. And it, it's just and that's now. This was 1994. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's pushing, well, you know. And and I also like th- that whole that whole bit. I think is amazing when they're when they're both like waddling in the, the streets. Is like this is fucking crazy. And like shots are being fired yeah. randomly, and you can hear Ving Rhames like, Ooh, like where is he? <laughs> you know. And he's swaying. There's people like, oh, you're right. That guy's crazy. And then he just starts shooting. Really cool. Like in the middle of where the fuck are we? Like he's holding donuts. Yeah. Hits him with a car. Like now we're in a pawn shop. Like. It's so off the wall, and I, I, I think it comes to a T, and then it's like, oh, God, oh, God, like, I have to look away, and then you're like, oh, wait, no, Bruce is coming back. <laughs> I love when he's picking up different yeah, weapons. He's like, yes. all right, a hammer. There's like a chainsaw. Yeah, chainsaw, yeah. he sees the sword, he's like, oh, shit. I, yeah, yeah, and, and, and I love when he's still holding it, like, really tightly, yeah. even when Ving Rhames is back up and, like, on his feet. Because he doesn't know how Marcellus is going to no, react. No, he's like, here. I fucked with this guy. Yeah. yeah, I messed up this guy's money. So he's like, I'm, I'm hold, hold, hold. <laughs> yeah. He's and like, then he's, are we good? <laughs> <laughs> it's Fuck, just, man. it's just really cool. I could talk about it all day. I have, to, I have to talk about it to justify it. Because if I just say the gimp scene, yeah, if you just left it there, people would have a lot. Of people questions. are going to be like, oh, what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there, there are, there are countless scenes, and I'm sure my opinion will change five years from now. It'll change to a different scene because this movie. It's an ever evolving kind of. It doesn't film. stop. Yeah. It's really what about annoying. you? What's your your top? <sighs> My favorite scene is it's a toss up between 
uh, when they call Winston Wolf, and he oh. has them clean up the car and everything, and he tells Vincent, you know, pretty please, sugar on top, clean the fucking car. Just that whole exchange of dialogue is fucking flawless. Please would be nice. Fuck Vincent, man. And, uh, of course, the uh, the adrenaline shot. That, uh, with Lance, oh, man. Yeah, that so whole, much fun. Yeah. Lance is fucking awesome. I love that guy. When he's like, he's like, wait, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know you. Who is this? Prank caller. Prank caller. <laughs> and then I don't know where there's a car crashing into his front lawn, into his garage. The fuck are you doing? Get the uh, shot. How many F words are in this movie? Do we know? Like, I gotta be like two. There's a lot. Gotta be over two hundred. It's on gotta the list be. for sure. Ah, oh, that's insane. I wish I'd looked that up. I don't know. That's a good little because there, there's an F word counter I think on IMDb for for some stuff. I think the reigning champions either like Goodfellas or The Departed. I yeah yeah. That one's surprising. Might be the big Lebowski, though. Like it's a De- Lebowski sneaks it in yeah. a lot. More you don't even notice it because you're laughing a lot. Yeah, <laughs> but with Departed, it's very like fuck, fuck, fuck every <laughs> every, and it's, it gets annoying. You're like, okay, <laughs> shut the hell up, dude. That was your Boston fuck, <laughs> fuck, fuck. <laughs> Just... uh, oh my god, it gets old, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, Pulp Fiction has an <coughs> IMDb score of eight point nine. Rotten Tomatoes sure. scored ninety four percent. Hell yeah! And yeah, it's just it's a flawless film. If you haven't seen it, god damn you! Uh, <laughs> yeah, you Get should. The hell out yeah, of here. you need to see it. If, if you're listening to Did this I podcast, break your concentration? and yeah. you haven't seen Pulp Fiction, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know anyone who yeah. hasn't seen it. Not, not even like everyone's gonna like it. Some people are gonna be like, this is kind of boring because they probably don't like dialogue too much or. It's like two and a half hours. That might be too long for some people, but uh, I I love it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, Pro- probably his. Maybe not my favorite film of his, but I think it's his best. I think it's his best. I think that's a toss. He's it's tough, but it, this I is... have never given a director more tens than I have Tarantino. Like that's for my true. Reviews. That's true. It's really remarkable. On to the next. What do we got? All right. So Tarantino would follow Pulp Fiction with a bizarre anthology film that he would work on with three fellow directors. 1995's Four Rooms. <laughs> Weird fucking movie. <laughs> Tarantino wrote and directed one of the film's four segments, his being titled The Man from Hollywood. Appropriate. Mm-hmm. The other three segments were The Missing Ingredient by Allison Anders, The Wrong Man by Alexander Rockwell, and The Misbehaviors by Robert Rodriguez, a short that would be the inspiration for Rodriguez's Spy Kids franchise later on. The film follows a bellhop named Ted, played by Tim Roth, who has a hell of a time as he visits four hotel rooms on New Year's Eve. Tarantino's segment features a big-time director named Chester Rush, played by Tarantino himself, Mm -hmm. who has a bet going with his friend Norman. If Norman can light his cigarette lighter ten times in a row without a misfire, Norman gets Chester's car. If he loses, Norman gets his pinky finger cut off. (laughs) Only rich people make these kind of bets. Ted the Bellhop is roped into being the guy who must cut off the finger if Norman loses, and the background in an uncredited role is Bruce Willis just kind of walking around. <laughs> <laughs> the film is admittedly ridiculous and an acquired taste, to be sure. For sure, for sure. It's got an IMDb score of 6.8 and a Rotten Tomatoes critic score of 14%. <laughs> so it's not for everybody. No, no. It's, it's kind of just thrown together. Um... Very bizarre film. I've only seen it once. And same, same. It's it's tough to to get all the way through. I'm gonna revisit it again. Yeah, um, I wanted to try to get to it before we did this, but couldn't find the time. Couldn't find the will. It used to be on Netflix. I don't think it yeah, is anymore. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's the the film's really only anchored by like it's held together by Tim Roth. I was just about to say that I love Tim, and yeah. that's that's what I remember about this. Yeah, is him, and his. <laughs> it's it's such an oddball film. Uh, there's not really a lot to talk about with that one because Tarantino's part is only, you know, it's the end of the movie. It's very minimal. Mm -hmm. And the segment is, you know, very dialogue heavy. It's everything that he's known for. And it's the only really decent part of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. So is it, it's not really his loss. It's more of a group loss. Yeah, yeah. This, this seemed to happen. He would do this stuff with uh, other people. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I, I like that. I like I like collaborating. I like, you know, he did stuff with Robert Rodriguez and Eli Roth and this and that. Uh, I liked when he did his own thing. Oh, me too. He's uh, always at his best when he has full control. Full, full reins of, yeah, of what's happening. For sure. Uh, Tarantino's next project would see him teaming up with longtime friend and collaborator Robert Rodriguez for 1996's From Dust Till Dawn. 
in which Tarantino co-wrote the screenplay and plays the role of Richard Gecko, brother to George Clooney's Seth Gecko. Two criminal brothers who end up fighting a bar full of Mexican vampires alongside the family they had taken hostage on their way to Mexico, fleeing from prison break. Fuck yes. This movie's incredibly violent. Very. Wacky and just unbelievable. One, one of the ones where there's some people who are not going to be able to watch it because of the... Visually, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> there's This is when people say, oh, it's a Tarantino. You know, it's too gory. This is what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this is the shit they're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fucking off the wall, man. This film also stars Harvey Keitel, Juliette oh, yeah. Lewis, oh, yeah. Cheech Marin, Danny Trejo, Tom Savini, and Salma Hayek. So a hell of a cast. And it's really like the half, the, the second half of it is the vampire part. Mm-hmm. Most of the movie is just these two criminals taking this family hostage and go, yeah. going to Mexico. Yeah. The vampires don't show up till the third till act. halfway, yeah. And it's so <laughs> out of the blue, but it's so fucking appropriate. <laughs> it's, it's just great. Oh, a lot of fun. I would love to see Tarantino do something like this again. Oh, With yeah. just like a crazy cast and just like kind of let's just fucking go for it. Absolutely. And this actually features the first appearance of Michael Parks as Earl McGraw, mm-hmm. the Texas Ranger who later appears in Kill Bill, Death Proof, and uh, Rodriguez's Planet Terror as the same character. He has a lot of character crossover sometimes, and Earl McGraw is the biggest Happens one. Happens to be, yeah, the one who yeah. dabbles in the most. Michael Parks was the best. Uh, From Dust Till Dawn's a crazy film, wildly entertaining, and it was later adapted into a series by Rodriguez on his El Rey network, and it ended in 2016 after its third season. Never checked that out. Me neither, but... I love this movie. I might... I would like to, I yeah. might give it a shot. Yeah, I would like to. There were two sequels. Both were uh, direct-to-video. From Dust Till Dawn 2, Texas Blood Money. And From Dust Till Dawn 3, The Hangman's Daughter, I think it was called. Mm. I haven't seen them, but... Uh, good rule of thumb with direct-to-video. It's usually going to suck. But there are exceptions, so... True. Maybe one True. day. But, uh... Crazy fucking movie. <laughs> And it, it is. Tarantino's got like a a big role in the movie. It's not just an appearance like he usually does. No, he's like he's like on the he's second bill. poster. Yeah, and shit. he's the yeah. second yeah. lead to George Clooney. It's weird to see George Clooney in a role like this too. It's, it really yeah. is. It's it's one of the very random diamonds in his in his long career of very serious roles. <laughs> this was right at the beginning, like fresh mm-hmm. off of ER, right mm-hmm. before Batman and Robin. Which amazingly, to this day, no matter what I'm thinking about, I can't believe that film didn't derail his career. Batman and Robin? Yeah. Yeah. I, it killed I, everybody else's career. It didn't kill his. It's like he's too, he, his smile his, his smile is too strong, too good looking. You know, he still, <laughs> he still pays people back. Wow. Like, if you go up to George Clooney and say, like, I really didn't like Batman and Robin, he will give you the amount a movie ticket costs in reparations. That's so cool. <laughs> he's like, I, I know, I get it. And he gives you, like, 15 I wouldn't bucks. say that to him, though. Like, if I ran into George Clooney, like, that wouldn't be the thing that would come up. I'd be like... <laughs> There's so many other things I love that he's done. You know? I'd be like, oh shit, it's Ulysses Everett McGill. <laughs> like, that would be my... <laughs> Gopher Everett? Uh, That's what I would say. Man. <laughs> shit. Uh, Alright, from Dust Till Dawn, IMDb score of 7.2, Rotten Tomatoes score of 63%. Which, I mean, it's Whatever, low, but yeah. it's positive. Yeah. So, 1997... Tarantino would write and direct his third official film, ah, Jackie Brown. Yes. Based on the novel Rum Punch by Elmore Leonard. Mm-hmm. The film follows a flight attendant named Jackie Brown, played by Pam Greer, who makes a deal with the ATF to rat on her gun-running boyfriend, Ordell Robbie, played by Samuel L. Jackson, but is also making her own play to steal half a million in cash right under everyone's noses. In addition to Pam Greer and Sam Jackson, the film also stars Michael Keaton, Robert Forster, Bridget Fonda, and Robert De Niro. <laughs> The film scored one Oscar nom for Best Supporting Actor for Robert Forster, who played bail bondsman Max Cherry, who assists Jackie Brown in her play. And I know you love Jackie Brown, so take favorite. it away, man. This is my, my favorite one to rewatch over and over. I love Jackie Brown. I watched it last night. Uh, oh, boy, I could talk about this one. First off, these characters. I love. It's the most subdued um, Tarantino movie, for sure, like 100%. It's the most subdued, most relaxed, most chill, least amount of violence. Most amount of like witty, like kind of like who's fucking over who. Um, doesn't feel doesn't really feel like a total Tarantino movie. I think that's mostly because it's based on a novel. Yeah, yeah, Rum yeah. Punch. Yeah, 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 uh, for sure. I mean, he normally writes his own thing, but he he had had to adapt something here. Um, ah, shit! It starts off him having badass um, female characters. You know, uh, Jackie Brown, P- Pam Greer is amazing, but like Max Cherry steals his show. He is <laughs> Robert Forster is a fucking awesome awesome 
actor in this one. Uh, his connection with Jackie Brown over the Delphonics is really cool. His awareness of what Jackie's doing the whole time. I'm probably getting fucked over the whole movie, but he's like, <laughs> I'm going to keep rolling with it, man. Michael Keaton playing a cop is great. Robert De Niro is like smoking weed the whole time. Yeah. Watch, He's just some watching guy. chicks shooting guns on a TV, yeah. you know, fucking Ordell's girl that hangs. You know, it's <laughs> it's amazing. Like uh, I have a blast every time. And then the, this is my favorite soundtrack by far. It has like hit after hit. Like every single one fits perfectly. This is the movie I was referencing earlier when there's a scene with Samuel L. and De- Robert De Niro at the beginning talking about guns. And uh, what song is it that's playing? It's just the guitar riff songs playing in the background while they're talking. And you're like, yeah, you, like, what is going on? What am I watching right now? Is this, it doesn't quite feel like a movie. Like, it's kind of aimless. Is that Sissy Strut? Yes, yeah, Sissy Strut. Yeah, there we go. The yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really cool. Uh, I, I love all the aesthetics of the movie. It's, uh, yeah, I could talk about it for ages. But I, I get it is not, it is not his best. It's not his most challenging movie. But I like it. I like the characters the most. Um, I respect a lot. The music is spot on. And then, uh, yeah, Pam Greer's, the, she, Jackie Brown's one of my favorite characters that, um, he's ever, ever had on the screen. <laughs> yeah, so. for sure. Ordell is definitely one of my favorite villains. Ordell is, ah, oh, man, my brother, my brother thinks that Samuel L's coolest, uh, Quentin Tarantino role is, uh, Ooh. Over like, that's, Jules, that's a tough over, sell. Over Warren in Hateful Eight? Oh, yeah. Dude, he is perfect in that. Yeah. Steven and Django. Yeah, like, yeah. Kill Bill, yeah. Fuck, he's, man, that's that's tough. It's very tough, but he, <laughs> he, he is perfect. He is perfect here. Um, he looks nasty. He's wearing that same <laughs> that same hat all the time. <laughs> and he's got his nice ponytail and his little tail coming off his chin. He's Yeah, he's perfect. And, yeah, I yeah I could go on and on, but what, what, what do you... I, I actually read your review. You gave it an eight, which is solid. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is a subdued movie and it's not what you expect out of Tarantino. So I'd like to get your take. Um, I've only seen Jackie Brown a couple of times. Um, I do like the movie a lot. I don't think it's his masterpiece. I don't think it's, no. his. there are films of his that I would watch before it, but mm-hmm. it is a great movie. It's very dialogue heavy, very character heavy. Yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, it was his first female led movie and Tarantino surprisingly writes female characters really well. Yeah, you you would think Tarantino's just this like misogynistic like douchebag because of some of his characters. Which he his... probably is, but when but, he but writes, he, he, he but he res- like you know he clearly respects women, and and he calls Uma Thurman like his muse. So yeah. he's you know he's like yeah, clearly yeah, there's clearly something there where he yeah he he respects women and wants to give them an opportunity to play. He wrote Kill Bill for her. Yeah, like yeah, for n- no one else was gonna do that role. Yeah, play that role. Yeah, so Jackie Brown definitely a win. Definitely uh, go check it out. Don't don't just dismiss yeah. it because it's not Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs. It's, it's a not lot. the movie I would introduce somebody to no, no. work for. No, but definitely a longtime fan knows and appreciates this movie for sure. And, and if you like just seeing all stars on the screen, we forgot to m- mention Chris Tucker has like a yeah. awesome awesome performance as Beaumont Livingston. <laughs> he's on the screen for just a minute holding a joint in a tank top, and he's like. I ain't getting no motherfucking truck for no minute. <laughs> it's, it's it's a blast. And, you know, Samuel Jackson convinces him, you know, and I won't tell you what happens, but, yeah, yeah that's it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Check that one out. Absolutely. IMDb score of 7.5. Rotten Tomatoes score of 87%. Fair enough. Fair enough. I agree. And Tarantino's next project would be an epic two-part revenge thriller titled Kill Bill, where a mm. deadly assassin wakes up from a four-year coma to pursue her old team of killers who put her in the coma, murdered her fiancé, and caused her to lose her baby. Part one of the film stars Uma Thurman as the unnamed bride, David Carradine as the ruthless enigmatic Bill, Lucy Liu as Yakuza boss Oren Ishii, Vivica A. Fox as an assassin-turned-homemaker Vernita Green, and Sonny Chiba as the legendary swordmaker Hattori Hanzo. We also see brief appearances from Daryl Hannah and Michael Madsen, whose roles are much more substantial in Kill Bill Volume 2. And considering its scale, an argument can be made for Kill Bill being Tarantino's masterpiece. But it's hard to pick a favorite with him because all his films are so damn good. Kill Bill Part 1. What, mm. are, your, what are your thoughts? Uh, these are both... I, it's hard for me to like separate them, but like you said, there are certain characters that are much more prevalent in the second one. and This is its own thing. You know, you are introduced, like you said, wakes up from a coma. Clearly, uh, there's some anger uh, involved. <laughs> some vengeance is, is required and... Uh, Ah, man, this is the coolest action. I'm trying to think of a movie that I like the action better. I love the John Wick movie, so that's probably what it. But like, I ah, I could watch the combat of this movie, these two movies, 
all day. The choreography is unbelievable. It's ridiculous. It's like watching people dance. It's like, good lord! It's artistic. It's like artistic chaos. <laughs> and uh, that's that's what that's that's why when I when I turn Kill Bill on, that's what I'm going for is uh, to see some some crazy shit, <laughs> yeah. crazy shit happen because I I forget just the sequences in which they happen. Like you said, it's like the choreography. It's like watching two people perform like a very very intricate dance. It's like watching people slice each other up. It's really cool. Kill Bill is my go-to Tarantino film for sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I knew, I knew you were bigger. I, I love them, but I knew you were bigger on them than I am. That, that was my introduction to Tarantino. Yeah, was, was Kill Bill Part Two? Wow. Actually, weirdly enough, wow. My mom thought Part One was too violent for me when I was a kid, but she let me watch Part Two, so I was pretty lost. Interesting. But um, I got the fair gist enough, of it. Fair enough. I, I was like, yeah. "This is cool. I wonder. I want to watch more of this stuff." So that was that's why Kill Bill. Well, was. man, and you 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 saw Dave Carradine, you're like, "Oh man, I gotta know what." You gotta know what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> with all this, because he's man, he's phenomenal. Oh, he's oh, he's Tarantino's he's my, greatest villain. He's my favorite part of, uh, or not uh, his greatest villain, but he's one of them. His greatest villain. We'll meet in part two. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Bill is a very interesting character because he's he's a shadow in the first film. Mm-hmm. He's just this lingering presence that everybody's it's like fucking afraid fucking of. Fucking Voldemort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They won't even say his name. Like, Sonny Chiba, Hattori Hanzo breaks his 30-year blood oath as soon as the bride mentions his name. Mm-hmm. It's such a great moment. Insane. <laughs> Insane. Like, oh, I get it. I'll make you a sword. <laughs> Just straight up. Oh, man. <laughs> Bill. Love it. Yeah, Kill Bill's a fucking masterpiece. It is, and it rolls right into... It. I, I, I've i read, we, we, we talked about this, um, that Tarantino thought about releasing a... Basically releasing it as one movie. Yeah. Like a four-hour vengeance epic. Yes. Which would have been one of the coolest theater experiences ever, but... It's only been shown We once. were both, what, eight, nine years old when it came out? No, he did the first this one. He, uh, no, I mean the oh, first one. The first one came out in 03. So yeah, we were nine so, yeah, years old. Yeah. not even considering it at the time. <laughs> But <laughs> can you imagine? He played uh, the whole, the four part epic, I mean, the four hour epic at, uh, at Con mm-hmm. in 2011. So cool. Calling it Kill Bill, the whole bloody affair. Ah. And he owns the only print. So cool. I want that movie so bad. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll meet him one day and that's what we'll ask him for. Maybe we'll, like, we, we got to save his life somehow. <laughs> so he'll be in our debt and then we can get a copy of <laughs> Just follow him around in the car everywhere he goes. Like, he starts slipping. Oh, I got you, Quentin. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh man, crazy. Uh, Kill Bill Part One, IMDb score of eight point one, Rotten Tomatoes score of eighty four. I think it should be a little higher. I think so too, for sure. Especially with considering it's like what what is what is the difference between Reservoir Dogs, which got a ninety one, and Kill Bill, which got an eighty four? Why is there a seven point gap? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Is Reservoir Dogs really that much better if we're going off that scale? I think that, admittedly, and I hate that this is true, but I think this is true. Violence puts a lot of people off. I think that's really what it is. People see yeah. a lot of people see violence yeah. and immediately think like, "Oh, this isn't as good as your." Yeah. Well, we stated our case for you know it's not just yeah. it's not just gore. It's 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 brilliantly put together. So, yeah. um, my like my girlfriend loves loves these two movies. She thinks they're amazing, and she thinks they look really pretty. Like they look the colors are really pretty, and yeah. uh, there's something to say about. that. I mean, the entire extended um, anime sequence mm-hmm. where we meet Oren Ishii is beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's, yeah. The most artistic thing he's ever done is, is Kill Bill Part 1, I think. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> People won't never understand. Well, that's the end of Part 1 of our Filmgasm look back on the career of Quentin Tarantino. Part 2 will be up next Wednesday, where we'll cover Kill Bill Volume 2, Death Proof, Inglorious Bastards, Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, and we'll take a look at what's to come with his upcoming Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Thanks for listening. If you want to see more from Filmgasm, check out my YouTube channel for weekly videos. Check out iTunes. We're there now. And you can always check out the website. That's filmgasm.com. And, of course, we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates on reviews, podcasts, articles, any sort of cool movie news or trailers that we ever feel like mentioning. Uh, available for free on iTunes. Really plugging that. <laughs> every Wednesday. Uh, yeah, very excited. I'm very happy that I get to do this. And I want to thank Austin Johnson for helping me take apart the career of one for of our sure. favorite directors. For sure. And... Uh, We hope this gave you a very powerful filmgasm, and hopefully, unlike Tarantino, you did not have to resort to feet for it. (laughs) So, stay tuned for part two next Wednesday. Till next time.